once again, I use 100% pure King James Bible teaching here. Um, tonight we're going to explore a little bit of um, uh, things that are not exactly written in the Bible, but more will be revealed soon. Um, just generally, this teaching involves the biblical analysis of how the human body's physical senses interact with the unseen organs of the mind, the soul and the heart, together with our own personal spirit. So this teaching aims to take the student to a different level of understanding about the Bible and especially the spiritual level of understanding as to how our bodies function based upon the following verses of Scripture. So this is the core of what this teaching is about. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus. Um, and from 2 Corinthians 4, But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. And, excuse me, go away. Uh, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might, by his spirit in the inner man. And I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. These are the four scripture verses that form the foundation of my teachings here in these series. Okay, so part four tonight is going to address what our spirit is. We'll talk about this. Just some reflection before we uh, commence. In part one of this series, the chart below in illustrated several vital organs that God has placed within our bodies, both physical and spiritual organs. So there's a YouTube video presentation, and this can be found at this address. So we don't really need to go over this too much, but basically we've got the outer man, and we've got the inner man with these organs. So in part, in, in part two of the series, we looked at how our five physical senses interact with the decision-making processes within our mind and how mankind's soul sometimes overrules these processes through lust. So a video presentation of this that explains the diagram below can be viewed at this YouTube video. So yeah. I think we all remember that diagram. Okay, now you've part three of this series, we looked at our heart and how God views it as being deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. We also looked at two examples of how the heart might influence our mind depending on whether it was a good heart or an evil heart and the type of treasure each heart brings forth. So you've seen this uh, just tonight. So today's teaching looks at mankind's spirit in the following topics. So the first part tonight examines the spirituality of Adam and Eve. Second uh, part talks about how uh, personal revelation unravels hidden Bible truths. The third part looks at how our spirit is a means of communication, meaning from spirit to spirit. And the fourth section is our spirit's relationship to our inner man. And the last section is how our spirit communicates. So the highlight section of the image below represents our personal spirit and we will be looking at this today and how it communicates between God and our spiritual organs. So this is really the section that we're looking at today. This is man's spirit here. Uh, it's in the purely spiritual realm. Um, within that realm is God 
So we've got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We also have evil spirits here operating in the as purely spiritual realm. But today, all we'll be looking at is man's spirit and to some degree how it interacts with the soul. Okay? So the first part is examining the spirituality of Adam and Eve. So before we commence to look into how our personal spirit functions within us, it is first necessary to look in, in the spiritual sense how God first created Adam and Eve to appreciate the significance of the fall that occurred for them and how that situation affected each of us as their descendants. Now, firstly, I've discovered that God does not reveal all that he wants us to know from what he has written in the Bible. He requires us to read, to study, and to research everything in the scriptures and then seek his answers to questions that we can't often find answers for. There's a lot of scripture verses in the Bible that are very hard to understand and find sometimes how they link into other things. Mm -hmm. So in Luke 19, Jesus said, And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. So to illustrate this concept, the drawing below shows that if lines connect the dots according to the numbering sequence, then the outline of the bird is completed. So from a Bible prophecy perspective, if God gives Christians firm statements in Scripture that are clear statements that cannot be refuted or doubted, such references could represent a dot on the drawing. If one then connects the dots by asking questions from God and then reasoning the responses, logic and rational thinking aims to fill in the gap between the two dots, as shown below. So I managed to obtain a sketch of a, a bird that's comprised of dots. So as you can see over here, we've got the dots numbered 1 to 10. And this is how the completed bird looks when you fill in the add lines between the numbers. So the numbers numbered points in the diagram represent the statements in Scripture. So this 10 might represent a Scripture verse. This 9 might represent another Scripture verse and the meaning that what this is referring to. This is really what these mean. These are actually truths mentioned in Scripture. And what we're looking for is to draw a line here which reveals a hidden truth. That's what this is trying to represent. So the lines that connect the dots are reasonable assumptions that enable the remainder of the picture that God is presenting to be completed. But these cannot be proven using scripture on their own. These assumptions are referred to in the Bible as personal revelations that come from the Holy Spirit to the individual. So we go to our next section. That's just showing the principle about where, where we're heading here. So the second one is how personal revelation unravels hidden Bible truths. Now, firstly, it is my firm belief that Adam and Eve communicated with each other and to God spirit to spirit prior to their fall. That's their fall from mm -hmm. grace right, and into God's judgment. Now, this means no individual, including God, in their communication, used their tongue in which to speak. Communication was from each individual spirit to the other individual spirit. The following process describes the means by which I have come to this conclusion using the line drawing illustration as the model in which to present this process. So, if we go to, so part one here is 
The following scripture verses form the dots of the true picture that Jesus desires to reveal to us. So, now, now the first scripture verse, which represents a dot, is really here. It's, well, I'll read it. Um, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree uh, of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. And this is the important part, for in the day that thou eatest, thou shalt surely die. Now, if we move on to the next one, and all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and then he died. And the third scripture verse is, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on the fire of hell. So these three verses represent three dots on that diagram, and to some degree here, they confirm the, the, the claim that I made. Adam and Eve communicated with each other to God and with God spirit to spirit. I'll have a look at this. So the analysis of Adam's spiritual death starts off here. The Lord first warned Adam that if he ate of the fruit of the tree, that in the day that he did so, he would surely die. Now, God doesn't lie. If he says that day he, that he's going to die, that's the day that he died. So Adam lived for probably more than 900 years after his sin of eating the forbidden fruit occurred in the garden. So he must have died spiritually the day that God judged him, but he couldn't have died physically because the scripture says that he died 930 years old. 930 years. So this is the conclusion between these two um two two verses okay so that this okay. proves that adam died spiritually that day not physically his spiritual death occurred when he was very young and his phys physical death was when he was very old so there was over 900 years between the two deaths okay so the analysis of adam's tongue after the fall is this prior to the fall when he sinned in the garden with eve Adam and Eve could not have spoken to God using their tongues because God nor they would have spoken in their sinless state with a tongue, quote, set on the fire of hell. Acquiring such a tongue could only have occurred after the fall. So Adam was created a son of God. It says that in the genealogy of Adam, uh, to Jesus. So therefore, yeah. we look. We have looked at that before. Therefore, God spoke to him prior to the fall in the same manner as the Holy Spirit spoke to Jesus when he was on earth. In other words, the sinless Godhead spoke to uh, Jesus because Jesus was always sinless in his life on earth. So yeah. God spoke to him spirit to spirit. And so why shouldn't God have spoken to Adam before the fall, spirit to spirit? An example yes. of this when, was when either God the Father or God the Holy Spirit imparted a word of knowledge to Jesus. And this occurred spirit to spirit during his ministry on the earth. So we've got some examples here. So Jesus used a word of knowledge from God to assist him to know exactly when the death of Lazarus occurred. So here we have in this example number one, how be it Jesus spoke of, spoke of his, meaning Lazarus' death, but they thought that he, meaning Jesus, had spoken of talking of Lazarus' rest in sleep. So he, in the previous verses he said, but Lazarus sleepeth. And they mistook him, but but he, but then Jesus said unto them plainly, this is where it says it here, Lazarus is dead. 
And I'm saying that God the Father or God the Holy Spirit informed Jesus spirit to spirit that Lazarus was indeed dead because the distance between where Jesus was and where Lazarus was was a four-day journey, walking. So it could have been 50 miles away. Mm. Okay, so they were using a word of knowledge from God the Father or the Holy Spirit. And that scripture verse says it's one of the nine gifts of the Spirit, and it says there, a word of knowledge. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent that you believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him, and in here it means that it's a four-day journey that Jesus was talking about. So just remember that this is, well, this, anyway, this is example one. Example two, it says in the scripture here, this is John 6, 61, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it. Now, this was about eating his flesh and drinking his blood in the communion um, service. He said to them, doth this offend you? But the point to highlight here is when Jesus knew in himself what the disciples were thinking and that they were beginning to get offended because they're trying to work out how can we eat this man's blood? Or, uh, body and how can we drink this man's blood is this man gone yeah. crazy I mean he's you know we're following this man we've given up our houses and our lands and our families and we've forsaken all and now this man's turning crazy saying how are we going to eat his flesh and drink his blood and they were thinking this in themselves when he was talking about it and then here it says, but when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, at his saying, and then he says, does, does this offend you? What I'm saying here is that Jesus knew their thoughts. Okay? Spirit yes. to spirit, he was listening to what they were saying. He didn't have to hear them with his ears. Okay? Okay, well, in example number three, uh, yeah, so Jesus is saying, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered and others said an angel spake to him. Now, this is a scene where Jesus, uh, or God the Father, is talking to Jesus and he said these words, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again to Jesus. But nobody else knew what, what God the Father was saying to Jesus. But instead, the people that stood by heard it and said that the voice that they heard thundered so it sounded like thunder in a cloud. Or another said, an angel spake to him. So it was in some sort of a language for those people that they couldn't understand. So yeah. what I'm saying is, is that if you read verse 30, which is down here, verse 30 um, indicates that uh, well jesus said that this was done for their um you know like the thunder and the voice from angel or the the sound of it was done to to enlighten them you know to educate them but normally speaking god the father would G uh, speak to jesus spirit to spirit and nobody would know what what he was saying that's the whole point here point here is that James 3 verse 36 says that the tongue is a fire, it's a world of iniquity, and it is set on the fire of hell. So the question is, would God have created Adam and Eve that way, with that type of tongue, at their creation? Well, I don't think yeah. so. God would have made Adam and Eve perfect, just like himself, made in his image. God yeah. has not been made with a tongue set on the fire of hell, so why should he make Adam and Eve uh, with a tongue that's set on the fire of hell? Mm -hmm. Okay? 
So the Apostle Paul said this about the Pharisees, meaning the religious people who are not born again. He said, their throat is an open sepulchre. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps or serpents is under their lips. So yeah, this, is, this is what the Apostle Paul said about the Pharisees who were who opposed themselves and who, you know, sought disciples of their own kind to make them twofold more a, uh, a child of the devil. That's what it says in the yes. scriptures. So these are the people whose throats an open sepulchre, you know. They, they don't have truth, they have lies, and they cause a lot of problems. So also the Apostle James says this about the tongue, and uh, this is really good it says all behold also the ships which though they be so great in size and are driven of fierce winds into their sails yet are they turned about with a very small helm or rudder whithersoever the govern, go, governor meaning the rudder turns right even so the tongue is a little member and boasts of great things Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth, which means the tongue can start up a little fire of mischief in a community, but if that mischief uh, takes hold, it can turn into a raging inferno. Okay, so from the above verses, these indicate to me that prior to the fall, both Adam and Eve communicated with each other and with God spirit to spirit. After the fall and after being cast out of Eden, Adam and Eve could no longer communicate spirit to spirit as they did previously, as they were now spiritually dead. And they were dead to each other and they were dead to God. They had no other choice other than to develop a language using their tongue that had been set on the fire of hell. This means that every descendant born of Adam and Eve since then has been born spiritually dead and with their tongue that has been set on the fire of hell. So this assumption is based upon scripture that joins the dots that I referred to in the drawing. Okay, well, um, this is section three here. We're going to section five shortly. Um, our spirit is a means of communication, and that communication is spirit to spirit. Uh, this is what we're going to look at. So referring to the diagram below, we can see that mankind's spirit in the model that I have presented, so this is the, the entire model, indicates it performs the following functions. It contains our conscience and it communicates with other spirit-based entities dwelling within the spirit world around us. So if we look at um, this model here, this whole thing is my model. This is I devised this um, structure or this model 15 years ago. Or, well, I got 10 there, but I started in uh, 2005. And I felt that, uh, you know, having the, spirit, the spiritual realm, the soulish realm and the physical realm divided up, that, you know, you could you divide different parts which are half uh, physical, like this soulish realm here is half physical and half spiritual. But over here we're dealing with the purely spiritual realm where we have the Godhead and we have evil spirits and we have man's spirit, and there's got to be an association between the three of these. So to, today we're just going to look at this one here at the moment. We will um, involve this one a little bit, but generally speaking, this is what we'll be looking at now in this model. So let's first look at the human conscience. Now, our Creator has given everyone born upon the earth a conscience. It doesn't matter who they are. If they are human and they're born on the earth, they all have a conscience. Now, it functions like a traffic light, 
light uh, when we're presented with moral and ethical situations and the right decision is required. So with the traffic light, which I've shown over here, the stop indicator is triggered when a situation of unrighteousness is presented to the individual. So let's just say you're walking along the street and then all, all of a sudden a man starts punching his wife or a woman, right? Well, that's unrighteousness. It shouldn't be allowed to happen. Somebody needs to intervene. So uh, this is where the stoplight would go on and the process within the man's mind and the heart and all sorts of things would start to work to decide what to get the body to do. And uh, there could be a bit of argument going on inside the body here, but um, the, the conscience would not be allowing this man to sleep if he just ran off and, and went home. It, this conscience could bother him not for the rest of the day but for the rest of his life if that woman got hurt and he could have stopped something from happening. So the conscience is a very, very important organ that's been given to us by our creator to help us uh, determine what is acceptable or unacceptable, what is right and wrong, and what is righteous and what is unrighteousness. And so this, this gets triggered by events that our eyes hear and ears and, and things like that. Okay, so then there's the orange uh, white signal in here. So the white indicator triggers when the situation is unsure, meaning maybe prayer is needed before proceeding. So these these all work together. They don't work, you know, simultaneously. They only work one at a time like any traffic light, so there's no confusion. But they, they get triggered on certain events. And this is really what God is doing. It's sort of like programmed into us to um, go, you know, each, each light would go on and off under various circumstances. So I've said that the go indicator generally operates most times unless the stop indicator is active. That could go for the wait indicator too. But this is all just part of fitting in with my model here. We've got to find out, you know, how the how these uh, the, the conscience works. So every individual can make their bodies, or, you know, their arms and legs and things, or their tongue respond according to the indications of their conscience or they can beat their conscience into submission so that they not only or no longer have a moral comp compass operating in their lives. So we all have more, the, the, the um, traffic light situation could be termed also a moral compass. A moral compass is what gives us our morality and our ethics in life. And if uh, if we damage that uh, set of traffic lights or if we damage that compass because we throw away our morals or our ethics, sometimes for money, sometimes for, um, you know, fame or fortune, that means then you're, you're damaging your conscience. And if you no longer have a moral compass or a, a traffic light operating in your life, then you've damaged your conscience. So it could be said that most criminals no longer have a conscience because of the suppression that they have inflicted upon their conscience. So similarly... There are some religions that are extremely unloving and cruel to people and animals. So such people who perpetrate cruelty also have no conscience. It's often, however, it's not often not them who have the problem, you know, with the cruelty to people and animals, but it's their religion that has the problem that quite often you know, forces them to do things that their conscience would normally tell them not to do because it's not right. Um, okay, so let's, uh, now we've looked at, we've just looked at the conscience, let's look at the human spirit. 
Now, the scriptures indicate that the human spirit is like a candle, and this candle ser is searching all the inward parts of the belly, If we and we've looked at Proverbs 20, verse 27 before. Now, as we have seen previously, the human spirit allows communication to occur between the individuals and entities in the spirit world. So these entities are, now there's three bullet points here. So for Christians, the Godhead, such as God the Father and Jesus Christ primarily, are entities in the spirit world with whom the Christians would communicate with. Okay, that's what that means. Now, for those who are in false religions, and you'll see I've got the Catholic and Anglican Church here, uh, there are many false religions about today, whether they be pagan, idolatrous religions that have no relationship to Christianity. So this is the Buddhist um, religion and Hindu because they have idols. Or Catholicism and its close relative, the Anglican Church, and both of these associated with associate with Christianity and their common idol, the Mary, Queen of Heaven. So here we have a very old photograph of Pope John Paul II in Rome, and he's praying to Mary. Um, that's a fairly famous photograph, that one. And here... Um, I found this on the internet yesterday. It's the Walsingham Procession. And here are the Anglican hierarchy of the Anglican Church. They're carrying a similar uh, idol of Mary with baby Jesus here um, uh, on this, uh, in, in this procession. So all this is here to show that false religions... Uh, 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 can be rooted in idolatry. And this is idolatry is something that God hates. So these are impersonators. Um, so whenever Christians who fail to study their Bibles embrace a false religious system, they are associating with an evil angel and evil spirits that make it impossible for its followers to ever form a personal relationship with the true Jesus Christ that happens through the new birth. They can never, ever form that because they, they prefer religion rather than truth. So this is because God hates idols and anything they represent, as it is plainly stated in the first of Ten Commandments in the Bible. So if we want to look at the first commandment in the Bible, it goes all the way back to Exodus. God said to the children of Israel, thou shalt have no other gods before me. This is an eternal commandment which God will never depart from. There's only the one true God and him alone. He will not share his glory with another, which it said elsewhere in the scriptures. So uh, that's the first commandment. The second commandment here is thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, such as Mary or angels, or that is in the earth beneath. And you can see in um, different uh, countries, elephants, lions, and all sorts of things that people make images to and worship. Or that is in the water under the earth, like fish or serpents, you're not allowed to bow down to them and worship them, okay? Now, for those people who do, and these people are the people that are breaking these commandments, written three and a half thousand years ago, and they've all got the Bible, so they're without excuse, God's curse will follow these people who worship these false gods. Um... So God says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me. So you can see this curse that God has pronounced on any of his people who purport to be a Jew 
or purport to be a Christian who have drifted into uh, false religion, which is idol idolatry. God the Father, he says himself, that he's going to curse the children of that person under the third, third and the fourth generation. So if a man is a Christian and then he drifts into a, a religion that's false, particularly an idolatrous one, that means that his children, his grandchildren and his great-grandchildren will all be cursed and they will never, ever get salvation. That's what it means. That's a very serious um, curse. Okay. Okay, so the third one. So we had the two groups up here. We had first the Christians who worship uh, and uh, communicate with God the Father and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in uh, spirit. We've got these false religions who they relate with evil angels and evil spirits. And now the third one are uh, witches, Satanists, mediums, um, all that type of thing. Now, th these are people who reject Christianity and prefer to be enticed to become involved in occult practices. This happened to me many years ago prior to my new birth when I became involved with a spiritualist church and was performing spiritual healing. Now, the occult offers people personal power over their lives. And this is very enticing to people who don't want to read the Bible and they don't really want to accept the God of creation. Now, I know that such power that's being offered is real through some of the personal experiences that I had. However, there is a very dark side to this power that inevitably leads its followers further away from the God of creation, and um, and it's not good. So I'm just saying that this is the where um, witches, Satanists, mediums, and that type of thing they can um, communicate with spirit entities in the spirit world that are of the dark side rather than the light side. So the the points to note here about the human spirit and its relationship to spiritual entities are these. Every young person is under the grace of God if being subjected to false Christianity, meaning religion, or to occult teachings by their parents. So what I'm saying there is the God of grace, um, his mercy endures forever. So if children and uh, are being brought up in false religions, God just has his hand on them until they're mature enough to start making their own decisions. So once the individuals mature, God arranges for his gospel preachers to convict such people that they need a saviour for their soul from spending eternity in hell because that's where the children of all of these people go, like witches and, and, and things like, like that. Now, in spiritual terms... The gospel represents a seed of faith sown into their heart. And God expects that one, day, that one day this seed should grow and ultimately bear fruit for him from the watering that's been undertaken by other Christians over the time. So the scripture verse that shows this pattern of how God works is in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 6. If someone can be prepared to read that for me. And it's only short where um, the Apostle Paul says, I have planted, meaning the seed sown, this is the gospel message in the heart of a person, and Apollo, Apollo or Apollos watered that seed um, sometime later by him going around uh, to visit the towns that they are revisiting the towns months uh, later. But God gave on the increase to finally bring about the uh, change in the people that he wanted to see. So for those who harden their heart because it contains evil treasure, that's the state of their heart, they're, they're an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart produces, uh, brings forth evil fruit. 
and that person refuses to respond to God's uh, sowing of the gospel seed into his heart, such people eventually harden their hearts so much to God that they can never be saved. Now, we must also remember that God does not give up on people quickly because his mercies endure forever. So what I'm trying to say here is that God expects the preacher, the gospel preacher, to do his part. He expects someone like Apollos to keep watering that seed. So that could be a teacher in the church or a pastor in the church watering the seed that's been sown. However, ultimately God's got to bring on the increase. So God himself actually gets involved in everybody's life to try and get their, get them their salvation. Now, yeah, should such an individual decide that they um, need a change of heart, that can happen. God can work on that, that individual's heart as well. Now, um, this fourth section is our spirit's relationship to our inner man. Now, in parts one, two, and three of this series, we showed the spiritual organs of our mind and our heart are contained within the soul that represents our inner man that dwells within our outer man, meaning our body. Now, our spirit is also a spiritual organ that dwells within our inner man, and it appears to perform the following functions according to Scripture. So a good man's spirit, so I'm, I'm contrasting a good man's spirit with a an evil man's spirit. So this is a good man. The Bible says that mankind's spirit is the candle of the Lord searching all the inward parts of the belly. So here in this diagram, I'm showing a man's spirit that also contains his conscience. And I've got the candle in here and I've got the set of traffic lights representing the conscience. Now this means that God uses our personal spirit to determine our desires and motives in everything we think say and do so our spirit is used by god to try our hearts this is what god uses our spirit to do okay so god also gives every every one of us every human a conscience this separates us from the animal kingdom okay we have a spirit and we have a conscience animals don't have a spirit and they don't have a conscience okay so God gives every one of us a conscience that acts like a traffic light based upon God's righteousness when confronted with and a circumstance would bring about a question, should I do that? Meaning, should I get involved with that man beating up his wife? Should I get involved with that person robbing someone else? That's what it is. The traffic light is the indicator. Now, if an individual is open to God, then the candle of the Lord inside his spirit burns brightly and one learns to listen to what our conscience is saying by obeying the traffic lights. That's just my view of things. I'm just trying to give an impression of how I believe our conscience and our spirit work uh, together. Now... If the individual has given his or her life to Jesus, meaning they're a Christian, then the Holy Spirit's influence on that person is profound, as this allows truth and many other gifts of the Spirit to manifest in that individual's life. So this is really the, the huge benefits of being a child of God, is that we can then tap into the knowledge, the wisdom, the understanding and the power of God in the spirit realm. Now, on the other hand, we have what's termed an evil man's spirit. So if we accept the statements above, then an evil man with the evil treasure of his heart will bring forth evil things. That's what we looked at last week, last week yes. So therefore, he will rely yes. on the corrupt motivations of his heart and will be prompted to do things from the lusts and passions within his soul. Now, this indicates 
if he's motivated by lusts and passions and corrupt motivations, that he has snuffed out the candle of the Lord and has destroyed the traffic lights within his body or in his mind, uh, his spirit, so that he essentially has no moral compass in life. This means that he has prevented his creator from being involved in his life and salvation is worthless to him. Therefore, his heart and the lust of his soul dictate to his mind the directions he wants to proceed in life. All of this will lead to destruction because without exercising any ethics or morality in his life, the human is no longer created in the image of God. This is the will of Satan through rebellion and sin for everyone on earth. So to be made in the image of God, we've got to have the moral compass of God. We've got to have the righteousness of God and let alone the love of God. You know, but we're it's talking lovely, about yeah. here getting the directions from our conscience and our conscience that uh, gives us these directions through the traffic light system, uh, you know, is what gives us the direction. So over here, what I've done here is I got an illustration of a roadblock. Um, so this man here who's the, you know, the man who's got the evil heart, um, what he's done is he's put a roadblock between his spirit that can give instructions to his heart and to his mind. Um, he's, he's destroyed the traffic light system, which is his conscience. He's blown out the candle of the Lord here. He wants nothing to do with God. Um, therefore, he's, he's broken all relationship with his creator Truth, uh, any of these sort of things don't worry him at all. He's quite happy to lie. And one thing I, I also found putting this together, that in Matthew chapter 15, verse 19, it says, For out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. Maybe someone might like to read Matthew 15, verse 19, because not only in the treasure chest here uh, uh, are either good treasure or evil treasure, uh, but the heart is desperately wicked. It's deceitful above all things. Who can know it? But even in the heart itself, even in a good man's heart, evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies, they still come out of the man's heart, no matter if he's a good man. So you really, so because the heart is so evil and wicked, we need the guidance of the Holy Spirit through our, uh, our, our man's spirit that is fully functional, not cut off like this man's um, spirit. Okay, so therefore his heart and the lust of his soul dictate to his mind the directions he wants to proceed in life. All of this will lead to destruction because without exercising any ethics or morality, the human is no longer created in the image of God. This is the will of Satan through rebellion and sin for everyone on the earth. Okay. So our final section here is how our spirit communicates. So if we can accept from statements made earlier that Adam and Eve communicated spirit to spirit to each other prior to the fall, I also believe it is possible for born-again Christians to regain this loss and communicate with each other spirit to spirit and even to God. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Asma. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So this is reversing the fall that took place in the Garden of Eden. This is what I believe is possible. And I'm going to give you some examples here. So below are examples of spirit-to-spirit -spirit communication that I have experienced personally. Okay, so there are, are occasions when my wife and I sometimes 
read each other's minds. Now, sometimes I say something and she says, but that's what I was thinking. Now, it, that sort of thing doesn't happen often, but it does happen. Now, I'm not saying it just happens to me exclusively. It probably happens to a lot of people uh, and probably even to some people who aren't born again uh, and even Christians. Um, you know, this could be a very common thing. I don't know. I haven't done any research on it. But I, what I'm saying down the bottom here is that talking spirit to spirit one of the fundamental requirements is love. And if you can get unsaved people who are passionately uh, in love with each other, and I believe that spiritually that can liven up their spirits so that they are, are thinking, you know, reading each other's minds sometimes. So if we move on to my second example here, also we arrive at certain locations together in an unbelievably uncanny timing, meaning perfect timing. So my wife Lynn can say, you know, uh, she'll be at the railway station at a certain time. I might have delays and things getting there, but all of a sudden I roll up and she's just getting off the train. Um, it's just uncanny the way things happen. So I believe that this could be uh, God's way of demonstrating that we are all in unity together with him because he arranges the circumstances and the timing becomes perfect. And there's a scripture verse that relates to that, which says, and a threefold cord is not easily broken. And there's an illustration that I found that's a threefold cord. It's known to be one of the strongest uh, ways that you can twine rope together to get a strong cord. So uh, the third example here is that my wife and I have had very few disagreements over our 16-year marriage. About six months ago, we had a little argument or a difference between us that resulted in us resolving the matter quickly and of me apologising to my wife. Now, we made up at, at that time, so it didn't go on long, uh, just a few minutes, and we made up and we moved on, and I, th I thought nothing about it. But the next day, I was simply walking through our home when immediately I had an impression placed upon my spirit that I should buy, go and buy her flowers. Now, I had not had that thought in my heart. So my mind reasoned that this was a very good thing to do. It always pays to be on the good side of your wife. I then put this as the highest priority, what I was doing then, and purchased some really nice flowers. And Lynn was really pleased. It made her very happy that I, you know, I brought a flower to, to say, I'm sorry, what happened? So I knew from this that God was involved with all of this amazing because it was a very clear impression that I had on my spirit, go and buy Lynn flowers. And it wasn't a voice that I heard in my head. So this is spirit to spirit communication, and it involves love, okay? So my point here is that Christians have to be open to trying to communicate with each other spirit to spirit. However needs one vital ingredient for it to work, and that is love between the participating parties. And it says, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. So Jesus has given uh, to his disciples the glory that God the Father had given Jesus. And he said, by giving them this, that they would be one, even as we, meaning God the Father, are one with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that through their unity, that is their oneness, that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. So that's uh, a key scripture in all of this about um, communicating spirit to spirit. That's just the way I see it. 
So we're at nearly at the end. Uh, all individual Christians should be trying to communicate with God spirit to spirit to discover the mysteries of the kingdom that all Christians are required to know and share. God does not share such mysteries with just one individual as this could make that Christian appear as a guru to the others. So elevating such Christians or individuals could lead to pride and eventual destruction of their soul. So uh, this last verse of scripture here in Luke 8, and he said unto you, meaning who are born again and spiritual, it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but to others, meaning those who prefer religion rather than the truths in the Bible, Jesus spoke to them in parables that seeing they, meaning the religious Christians, might not see and hearing they might not understand. So this is the difference between the born-again Christian and the religious Christian. Uh, the born-again Christians trying to communicate with God and trying to communicate with his brothers and sisters and all of this is to, is to be conducted in love. That's really what uh, the message is here tonight. So praise the Lord. That's the end of the uh, presentation. Um, if praise anybody, the <laughs> praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. <laughs> and if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to try and answer them for you. Uh, nobody knows. There's, it's not stated in scripture how old they were. Um, there are no, there's no age as to how old Adam was when um, God took a rib out of his body and created Eve. Um, it says earlier that um, Adam uh, was put in the garden with all the animals and God was trying to find a mate for him, like, um, you know, uh, well, it wasn't like, all I can say is that God couldn't find a mate for Adam, someone that Adam could relate to. So he put him to sleep, took out a rib and made Eve. So we don't know how long they existed in the garden in that state before the serpent yeah. came and deceived them. And uh, they could have been there 10, 20, 30, 40 years. The whole thing is that um, the people back then didn't start having children until they were about 150 years old. So they could have been very old when they, in that sense, 150 years old when they were cast out of the garden. And then they had Cain and then they had Abel. And uh, Adam probably lived another four or oh, several, you know, 800 years after that. So there are big gaps if we look at the, the ages of other people of their generation. Well, this, this comes usually from the spirit and the conscience that override these lusts and, uh, well, even, even with the lusts and the soul. Everything sort of passes from, from God through the man's spirit and his conscience up here to make sure that the scales in the man's mind are tilted in the right direction for him to do the right things. Because out of here, there's got to be a decision. This is the path here of where the decision takes place to make the mind, uh, the body work. So this is, this is the command line that goes to the man's brain that makes his body work. So it could be just to move the eyes. It could be to move the arms and the legs from the decision that's been made here. So what I'm saying is that if this area here is the source of evil and wickedness and deceit and lying um, to try and get us to, um, you know, not do the right thing, we have to look at the other parts, really the spiritual side of us, to try and help us to become that good person that 
God wants us to be. Mm. So without being saved, yeah. we've got to have a good spirit with a good conscience and um, uh, and the, the, this candle going and the lights going so that spiritually speaking, um, it's not entirely dead. It's only dead to God. It's, it's a very much an alive organ, but it, it's tending to regulate all of the evil that's coming out of the heart and all of the lusts and uh, the pride of life that's that's coming up here. This, this pathway overrides all of that and goes through here. Um, <laughs> it's very, very hard to say something um, like a, a broad paintbrush that all born-again Christians can speak spirit to spirit. Um, it's like everything. It's got to be evidence. And you see, uh, you can have uh, two Christians in a household like a husband and wife, and they can both claim mm. born again. But if the husband doesn't love his wife as Christ so loved the church and gave himself for it, that it might be a glorious church, then um, there would be a barrier between him and his wife, and that would prevent in communicating spirit to spirit. So uh, that that's what I feel. I feel that um, there are a lot of Christians today who believe they're born again. Now, like everything in God's kingdom, it's got to bring forth fruit. And being born again, um, there's an article on my blog that explains what you know is required to be born again. And so I I, uh, I don't use the term lightly. I use it um, to try and say that people have got to have the evidence. So if uh, people, if Christians are claiming born again, but they still have resentment in them against somebody, if they've got hurts that um, you know that other that, that others have done to them, like grudges and things like that. Um, you know, the Bible says if you hate your brother, uh, you, you are a, equivalent of a murderer in the, in the spirit. So, you know, if born-again Christians have still got some of these uh, issues in their lives, um, then they really would, they wouldn't be able to speak spirit to spirit. It would be like that barrier that you can see on the screen there. It would create a lot of problems. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, what I am saying is that if you, you've got a church full of born-again Christians, well, the first evidence of them being born again would be that they would love one another. And Jesus said that ye are my disciples if ye have love one for another. And uh, if you read 1 Corinthians 13, that's the love chapter of the Bible. And, you know, if we don't have love in us, well, we're just like sounding brass and a tink tinkling cymbal. And uh, we mean nothing in God's uh, thing. So love is a very important aspect of our Christian faith. And it's, uh, it's a real problem. If, uh, it creates a lot of problems in the church and it creates a lot of problems in the home if love is not evident. love between husbands and wives and it's love between the couples and it's all genuine godly love perfect yes it should it should happen it, the the the, um, the communication spirit to spirit should happen and this is really a very fundamental requirement for christians to be able to go out and evangelize and work together as the body of christ okay that's that's the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Because, you know, the, the body's supposed to be fitly joined together, as it says in the Old Testament. And if it's fitly joined together, it's got to communicate. Um, all the body members have got to communicate together and they've got to communicate 
spiritually. So this is a fundamental yeah, yeah. requirement for all Christians to work together, is that they've got spiritual communication. So this is really what it's all about, where everybody's um, matured to become a good soldier of Jesus Christ and yeah. Yeah. somebody's in an O's ministry, an I ministry. This could be prophetic. Uh, ear ministry, uh, hand ministry and a foot ministry. All of these are just a handful of ministries in the body of Christ. Somebody's got to be a heart, someone's got to be a lung, someone's got to be a kidney, someone's got to be a knee joint. You know, you go on. Um, these are the what the Bible in the old King James calls the uncomely members. These are the ones that are hidden inside the body. But these ones, like the hands and the eyes and the nose, these are the, the, the visible ones that take, uh, you know, um, that, that have prominent ministries within the church. So this is what we're all supposed to, we're all supposed to re represent. So if a hand needs to talk to an eye, it's got to talk spiritually to the eye. That's what I'm mm -hmm. saying. And if, and if the eye needs to talk to the foot, it's got to talk spiritually between the two. It can't talk verbally. Okay? That's how it all works.